Chapter Seventeen of the Seventh Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seventh Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Seventeen. First Day in a New School. It had been decided between Mr. Morrison and the Colonel, who had been corresponding about the matter, not to start Geraldine in the Sunnyside Seminary until she appeared to be quite contented to stay in the village. But on the Monday morning following the making of her dress, Geraldine herself appeared in the breakfast room unusually early and asked her Uncle Colonel if he would not take her out to the seminary and introduce her to Miss de Morris. How the old gentleman's face brightened as he asked, "'And so you are really content to stay and to be the sunshine of my home?' impulsively the girl kissed his cheek i'm glad you want me she said sincerely and i'll try to be sunny then as mrs gray had entered the room with a cheery good morning the colonel shared the good news there was a mistiness in the gray eyes of the little old lady and a song of thanksgiving in her heart geraldine to prove them that her heart was changed went over and kissed mrs gray also as she said my dear little make-believe grandmother is helping me to see things in a different light, more as I would have seen them if mother had lived. Then into the room came Alfred, and the good news was told to him. That's great, he exclaimed. Dad will be so pleased. He is certainly a soft spot in his big heart for this little old town. Say, Mrs. Gray, do you mind if I eat in a rush? I'm afraid I'll be late for the student special if I don't hurry. Alfred and Jack went every morning to the prep school in Dorchester. During the sleigh ride to the seminary, Geraldine chatted happily about how surprised the girls would be to see her there. She had purposely timed their going when classes would be occupied, that she might surprise them at the recess of which they had told her. And that is just what happened. After making arrangements with Mr. Morris for his ward to complete the winter term in the seminary, the colonel departed, promising to return at the closing hour but Geraldine said that she would like to walk back to town with the other girls, and that she would wait at Mary Lee's house until Jack and Alfred returned from Dorchester. Then she and her brother could return together. The colonel noticed a slight flushing of her pretty face as she made the suggestion, and he wondered about it as he drove home through the crisp, sunlit morning. After planning with Mr. Morris about the classes she would enter, Geraldine was told that she might wait in the library where a cheerful fire was burning in the hearth, and that, after the mid-morning recreation, she might accompany her friends to Miss Preen's English class. As Geraldine sat in the big comfortable chair in front of the fire, she had time to think how very different her stay in Sunnyside was turning out from what she had expected, how she had dreaded it, and how selfish and stubborn she had been. It was a wonder that the colonel had ever wanted her to stay, and how could that dear Miss Gray be so nice to her when she had snubbed her so rudely? Even the girls had been generous to overlook her snobbiness when they came to call upon her. She actually laughed aloud when the thought of the prank they played upon her. Then she curled up in the chair and tried to hide, for the gong was announcing recess. A moment later, merry laughing was heard as the doors up and down the corridor opened and the day pupils and boarding pupils emerged from their classes. Geraldine was wondering where her group of friends would go. She had hoped they would flock to the library, nor was she disappointed. Although she could not see them, she knew their voices. Mary was saying, "'Girls, come in the library a minute. I have news for you.' "'Is it secret?' Bertha asked. "'I'll say it is. That is. Just at first. After a time we'll tell to Geraldine. Are we all here? Close the door, will you? Nobody will notice.' "'No, we're not all here. Gertrude isn't. Where can she be? Why didn't she come to school today?' Rose wondered. "'That's why I've called the special meeting,' Mary explained. "'Gertrude has gone to Dorchester to spend the winter. It was very sudden. She didn't even have time to call you all up to say good-bye. Her mother's sister was taken ill last night, and they sent for Gertrude to take care of the children. Her aunt thinks everything of Trudy, and as she has to go to the hospital for an operation, she said she couldn't go contentedly unless Gertrude was there to look after her two babies. It will be spring before she can return. Oh, I say, that is too bad. She'll miss all the fun we've planned for the winter, Bertha said. But you have more to tell, Mary. What is it? Yes, I have, their president confessed. Gertrude suggested that, since we need a seventh girl in our secret society, she would like us to invite— there was a sudden rustling noise. Hark, there's someone in the room, Peggy announced. The girl in hiding sprang up. I'm terribly sorry, girls, she said. I didn't want to eavesdrop. I was crouching down the, so that I could leap out and surprise you when you came over by the fire, as I suppose, of course, you would. 
With a glad cry of surprise, her friends surrounded Geraldine, asking a dozen questions at once. How did she happen to be here? Was she going to stay? And when she had answered them all satisfactorily, Mary announced, This is like a play. Characters entered just when they're needed. Geraldine's face was beaming. Oh, I am so glad. I am wanted, even, she told them. I can't understand, though, how I could be needed. We'll have to tell you later, the President announced. The ten-minute recess is over. Hear that cruel gong? Now, Jerry, what class are you to start in? Mr. Morris said that if I would accompany Mary Lee everywhere she went, I couldn't go wrong. Oh, goody, good, Betty Bird exclaimed. That means we're all in Miss Preen's English class. Shh, come on, Rose called to them from the open doorway. Mary introduced the new pupil to the angular Miss Preen, and Geraldine thought she had never seen a thinner person or one with sharper eyes. She felt that she would heartily dislike the English teacher, but what did that matter as long as she was in the class with all of her friends? Before the hour was over, Geraldine had, at least, to acknowledge to herself that Miss Preen knew how to teach, and that she made the subject very interesting. After all, what more did one require in a teacher? From there they went to a song service conducted in the basement recreation hall by Professor Lowsley, whose hair, soft and grey and wavy, rested on his shoulders. His near-sighted eyes were gentle and light blue, and his manner one of infinite patience. For half an hour the forty girls in the school practised vocal scales all together. Then they sang songs, some old and some new, until the gong announced them for a change in activities. Geraldine was interested to know what was to happen next. We go to lunch now, Mary informed her, after we've washed up in yonder lavatory. The dining rooms were also in the basement, beyond the recreation hall, and Geraldine was delighted to find that she was to occupy Gertrude's place at the table with her six friends, and one teacher, a Miss Adelaine Brockett. Young, who had been in charge of Jim, understanding the theatricals and games. In reality she was Mr. Morris's assistant, and often had an entire charge of the seminary during the principal's absences. The girls seemed to adore Miss Brockett, and of course Mary could not talk about their club plans with anyone else present. "'Isn't it great that we day pupils are allowed to have lunch here in these wintry days? It's a long mile to the middle of town, and that pokey old street car could never get us home and back in time for classes,' Peg said to Geraldine, who agreed it was a jolly plan. "'You missed math,' Rose informed her. "'We have that torturous subject first thing in the morning.' Then the afternoon classes began, history, general sciences, drawing, and French. But at last the three o'clock arrived and the girls started to walk to town. I'm so glad you didn't have your Uncle Colonel call for you, Mary informed Geraldine, who was walking at her side, the other girls following two by two, that being as wide as the walk had been shoveled in that suburban part of town. They passed fine old homes set far back on wide, snow-covered grounds among bare old trees. We have the most important club meeting at my house today, and... Geraldine stood still, exclaiming with sincere disappointment. Then I can't stop there and wait for Alfred, as I told my Uncle Colonel I would. Why not? Mary asked. Then before her companion could reply, she exclaimed, Oh, I understand now. You think we wouldn't want to discuss club business with you there. You're wrong, Jerry, my dear. We especially do want you there. Now don't ask me any questions. This is a secret club, and it wouldn't do for me to tell you a thing about it until the meeting is called. And with that explanation, the curious Geraldine had to be content. End of chapter 17